graduate work in fisheries and freshwater ecology from the University of Montana in uh, Missoula. Uh, upon returning to Vermont, Pat served as the policy and legislative director for the Vermont Natural Resource Council and working on a variety of critical fish and wildlife issues. He's also worked as the Director of Governmental Affairs and Environmental Advancement at Vermont Law School before becoming the uh, Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. He received his undergraduate degree from Middlebury College. Please welcome Patrick Berry. Thanks, Steve. Um, I've, before I get started, I've had a bit of a head cold, so if I say something completely non sequitur, you have to forgive me. Um, I, I, t I am really impressed with the turnout here today, um, and maybe it's because we love what we do. I mean, at least that's what I'm going to tell myself. I'm sure most folks are aware that um, a lot of the Agency of Natural Resources uh, divisions and departments, the central office function, have been moved to the National Life Campus down in Montclair. I don't know if you've ever been there, and there are some very strict policies including prohibition against laughter and music and job satisfaction. <laughs> and I can tell you that we violate those policies pretty much every day, and I'm sure that Michael and David would say the same thing, my fellow commissioner. Speaking of which, um, most of the time when, when the three of us speak somewhere, I go last, which is really unfortunate because there's nothing left to say, <laughs> and it becomes really obvious how much smarter they am than me. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to lead it off here, too. Um, sticking with the theme of these emerging needs uh, for forest health and forest resources and the connection to fish and wildlife issues. Um, you know, when Michael and I were first getting to know each other, Michael, of course, Commissioner, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of uh, Forest Parks and Recreation, and I said, you know, Michael, we've got to talk about, you know, these forest and wildlife issues because they're inextricably linked. And he said, no, they're the same thing. And he's absolutely right. So when I talk about these wildlife issues um, specific to uh, what we do at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, I say that from a place of realizing that they are not just inextricably linked, but that they really are, they're the same things, and that's consistent with this conference theme. Um, I'm sure many of you know, but we have uh, a lot to do in fish and wildlife. We are responsible for 41 species of reptiles and amphibians, 89 species of fish, 58 species of mammals, 193 species of breeding birds, 15,000 plants, no, 15,000 insects, 2,000 plants, in 75 natural communities, give or take a few. So we don't have a whole lot to do. But what, what's interesting is that I don't think most people realize the breadth of what it is that we're required to do, some of which may be reflected in what you read in the newspaper or see on TV or how we're funded, which, which is a big challenge for us. And for those of you who don't know, you know we get 40% of our funding from fishing, hunting, and trapping license sales. We get an additional 40% of our funding from uh, federal grants, uh, both the Pippin Robertson and Dingle Johnson grants, that come either from excise taxes on guns, ammunition, or fishing equipment. Um, and uh, so that becomes an area of focus that you know we really can't deny. Over time, however, um, that system of funding has become a user pay, everyone benefit system, which is important to acknowledge because while those sources of funding are, you would think, what it would leave us managing for very discrete parts of what we do, we're responsible for every one of those species that we just named. The challenge is finding a way to fund it and finding a way to manage it. That becomes the real challenge. So if, if Aldo Leopold is right in what he said, that the first rule of intelligent tinkering is saving all the parts, then we have a lot of parts that we need to save and we don't have a lot of resources to do it. Therein lies the value of these cooperatives, the collaborations and partnerships. And it's really interesting because I, I think John um, did a very good job of synthesizing what the needs are. It's so easy for us to say, you know, we're all doing this great work, but we need to actually work together a little better. We need to prioritize a little better. But you're absolutely right. And to your credit, I have to say, we've begun to build those relationships. In fact, John, um, and Alan came to, uh, came to the Agency of Natural Resources and said, you know, we have a lot of great students, we have a lot of great resources, but we're not really working together quite as well as we could to put those two things together. I mean, we have needs within our department and within our agency that we simply cannot get to. And we've actually started this cooperative process 
of working with the University of Vermont to try to bring projects um, to graduate students, undergraduate students, find interns to help us actually achieve some of the work that we do. In addition to that, we have the Cooperative Research Unit. We certainly have this uh, monitoring cooperative. Um, state Wildlife Grants uh, is one way, both the, both the, uh, these are the, the, the SWIG grants as they're known, um, for both the internal departmental research management work, also the competitive grants that go out to a number of our, of our partners, everybody from Audubon um, to the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, um, that actually help us um, work on those species of greatest conservation need. Um, there's a, the uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. There's another potential partner to work on these. But what's interesting to me is that while we recognize the need to collaborate more, um, it feels like we're just in these beginning stages. And perhaps it's because the world is changing so fast. Uh, we realize that we've got to get a handle on where we're headed uh, and what we have now, and there are limited resources for what we're doing. Um, I'll give you an example. The state wildlife grants, which are used, again, for us to help fund and work on species of greatest conservation needs, uh, have plummeted in, um, in the last three years, um, mostly under these congressional uh, budget stalemates. I mean, we have to make up that money from someplace else. Excuse me. Been able to do that partly through some of our other federal grants, but what we found internally in trying to prioritize our work is that we're going to have to capitalize on those partnerships or else we're simply not going to be able to do the work that we need to do. I'll give you a couple examples of the need actually specifically uh, for monitoring. Um, I'm sure folks have heard or read uh, or seen on TV concerns about crash in bee populations, honeybees, bumblebees, and it's, it's, it's a huge problem. And I find this fascinating because some of the critters that you would think of as sort of, you know, your icky critters you don't like, go back 10 years, what people thought about bats, you know, those are creepy things that bite you in the neck and you dress up as one for Halloween, right? We now realize <laughs> that without them, you know, we lose billions. Or look at uh, pollinators like bees, right? You know, those are things that sting you and you, you know, you swap them and kill them and you put pesticides all over the place and you want to kill them because they're bad. And now we realize as they crash, that it's a huge impact economically and environmentally. Um, we have just had conversations, I know the Endangered Species Committee has looked at the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. I mean, whoever here, aside from Jim, you know, has heard of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee? Probably, well, a few people, but, but probably not a lot. It's a critical pollinator, and we don't even know where they've gone. And the problem is that we weren't really tracking them um, or monitoring them over time because I don't think we ever really thought there'd be a significant problem. And in most parts of the Northeast, uh, the populations have crashed by 85 to 95 percent. In fact, we can't even study them in Vermont because we can't find any. So if we actually want to do something about restoring a population of, of rusty patch bumblebees, we're going to have to go get some from someplace else. I was joking that we'll start a bee hatchery. Nobody thought that was funny. But you know, the point is that <laughs> we're, we're going to have to get pretty creative about, um, about restoring these these populations. And what we found was that they just kind of disappeared before our under, you know, kind of under our noses. There were certainly people who flagged this for a long time, and to them I would give them credit. Um, but if there was ever an example of the need for monitoring, there's one right there. Here's another good one. Um, the Nighthawk um, has just been listed by the Endangered Species Committee. You go back 20 and 30 years, and they were everywhere. They used to fly, people would tell you, you'd be in downtown Burlington, and there wasn't a night you didn't see a Nighthawk or downtown Montpelier, they were, they were common. And then right before our very eyes, they just kind of disappeared. What happened to them? I mean, we can assume that there was loss of habitat. Um, we can assume there was changes in habitat. Um, there could be other factors. We're not really entirely sure. Um, but the fact is, they just kind of disappeared. And I could go on and on with those kinds of examples. So I think what we're discovering is that for our future needs, you know, this monitoring work is going to be critical not just for the species we identify in our wildlife action plans, those species of greatest conservation need, but also the species that are maybe common species. And if you look at um, the biodiversity uh, data work that's being done, you know, in points around the state, which is another good collaborative uh, effort uh, we can highlight, um, you know, that's a good place to begin, um, to begin to track those species where there's a significant decline. We can't just wait until these species are gone 
look at what happened to them, pesticides, parasites, changes in habitat, changes in forest composition, I mean there's a variety of factors, and then try to look backwards without cooperation, without collaboration, without monitoring, then we're going to be looking at more rusty pack bumblebees, and there's probably three more bee species that are going to be headed for listing here pretty soon. More nighthawks, more common whippoorwills, more edge species we're losing, like the chestnut-sided warbler, and on and on and on. So I can't um, overstate the importance of the work that's done um, within this unit and the, the monitoring needs uh, looking ahead, and specifically um, related to climate change needs. I mean, the world is changing so fast, it's really hard to keep up with what those needs are going to be. It's hard to predict what those needs are going to be. We focus a lot of times on adaptation and probably not enough time on projection of where we're going to find ourselves in trouble. Probably some of the boreal species uh, that are in the edge of their range, whether it's the spruce grouse or the pine marten. I mean, I think those are things we can predict we're going to have issues with. Um, but we've got to get out ahead, I think, um, looking at climate change models so that we don't get caught flat-footed and make sure that we're actually um, continuing to enhance that collaboration, that cooperation, um, monitoring where we can, studying where we can, um, sharing information with our partners where we can, um, because if, if I'm going to actually achieve my mission of protecting and conserving Vermont's fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for future generations, we simply can't uh, do it alone. Anyway, I'll stop there because I know we're running a little short on time and see if there are any questions. Yes, questions for uh, Good question. Uh, what's the deal with moose? Um, we, uh, well, I have been pretty concerned about uh, both biological health indices and population indices with regard to moose. It's really fascinating because their population exploded, as many of you know, um, you know, coming into the late uh, 1990s to the point and in, into 2000s where um, they were uh, really challenging. Uh, the ability for people to regenerate forest products, especially up in the Northeast Kingdom, and they were basically eating themselves out of their available food resources and habitat. So we began to, you know, luckily, we're able to manage moose um, through our partners who are hunters and get populations down to where the densities um, were a lot healthier from both habitat and an individual <coughs> animal perspective. And right at the time we got to that point, we found that um, there were a lot of other problems with uh, related to ticks, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard. Um, winter ticks, there can be anywhere from 30,000 to 100,000 winter ticks on moose. Uh, that can lead to, lead to everything from blood loss to uh, younger yearling moose tend to try to rub them off. They lose their guard hairs. They can die of hypothermia. Um, and we believe a lot of that's due to climate change. Uh, the state of Minnesota, which has you know, always been the place where people think of moose in the lower 48 states you know, over the last few, few decades, had two distinct populations of moose. They shut down the hunting season in one population years ago, and they shut down the hunting season for the other population uh, just last year. And I talked to my counterpart in Maine, um, and they have all kinds of other disease, not necessarily ticks, um, but uh, flukes and um, brain worm, and you know, they're doing a whole study on this. Um, and again, they believe a lot of that may be due to climate change, habitat changes, and the like. Um, but it would just be such a shame at the same time that we had this incredible species come back into our lives as a part of our natural heritage uh, to disappear just as quickly in just a few decades and a few generations. So we're working with the state of New Hampshire and the studies they're doing to look and see what the problems are. It's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions for Pat? What an easy crowd. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve.